Just when you think you've seen and heard all of the shocking stories on social media, online, you see headlines like this. Transgender woman set to be the first ever to be executed for 2003 murder or whatever the headline is going to tell you. I'm Lamont at Large. Today, we're in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm at the Mount Lebanon Cemetery. I'm going to visit the grave of a woman who was murdered by that carbon-based life form. First and foremost, before we begin the video, I'm going to tell you like this. If you get easily offended by certain trigger words, whatever that really means, I wouldn't watch this video. I would actually stay far away from this video because sometimes, as I always say, the truth hurts and I don't want to offend anybody. So without further ado, let's spill some truth and talk about this uh, senseless and horrible, horrible murder. This man's name right here is Scott McLaughlin. And he was executed on January 3rd of 2023. He calls himself a trans woman. Well, now he's transdimensional, as in he no longer resides on this earthly plane. Justice was done upon him for the 2003 murder of Beverly Gunther. So how did this man end up in his position? Well, I'm going to explain the story right now. Scott McLaughlin was born somewhere in 1973 or 1974 in the St. Louis, Missouri area. And from the brief history that I've read online about him, uh, he did not have a good upbringing. He was born to a alcoholic father and a prostitute mother. Him and his siblings lived in squalor and filth um, somewhere here in the uh, St. Louis uh, slash St. Charles metro area. Eventually, CPS comes in and removes the kids from the home. Uh, they're put in an orphanage and eventually they're adopted by a man by the last name of McLaughlin. Uh, this guy was a St. Louis cop and depending on who or what you want to believe uh, he was a very very strict slash stern disciplinarian and maybe some would say uh, his discipline sometimes would go a little too far uh, in interviews scott has claimed that his father would beat him with paddles uh, supposedly beat him with his police baton he would tase him uh, stuff like that when he was nine years old when he was in school, he was described as having a uh, very deep psychological problem. He was given an IQ test and it was deemed that it was considered low. It was somewhere in the 80s, uh, lower than the average IQ. And he was diagnosed with having depression issues and having a hyperactivity attention deficit disorder. So this kid was put in special education classes. Now, when you tell a kid that your IQ is low or you're in the special needs class or whatever you want to call it, it's going to be a blow to your self-esteem. I can tell you that. And continuing on from elementary going into high school, uh, Scott had deep, deep rooted problems. And when he was 19 years old, uh, he was arrested and charged for the rape of a 14 year old girl, which he served time for in a Missouri prison. Enter one Beverly Gunther. At a time she was married with three children and quite possibly the marriage was going okay. And then her one and a half year old baby boy accidentally drowned in a swimming pool. After that happened, the death of her child the marriage started straying and it started falling on hard times. Eventually her and her husband got a divorce and she moved on getting her own place with her remaining two children. I don't know how it happened, but she meets one Scott McLaughlin. 
And at first, what seemed like a whirlwind romance where everything just kind of happened so fast. I'm sure some of you out there have been in one of those where you meet a person and they have a certain uh, physical or, or psychological trait that you enjoy or what have you and everything just starts moving so fast and that's what happened in her case and it seemed like just within a few weeks or so that Scott had already moved in to her place and as soon as he moved in trouble started brewing uh, she seen Scott for what he is was just a very troubled man with deep-rooted psychological issues and she wanted really no part of him so she throws him out of her home and he's one of those guys that can't take no for an answer you're trying to call this woman and she's clearly explaining to you that she wants nothing to do with you yet you keep coming around and bothering her all the time Finally, it got to the point where he was coming to her home, banging on her door, banging on her window, asking to please let, you know, have her let him back in. And finally, it got serious where he's showing up at her job and threatening her. She finally is forced to get a police protective order on him. And in October of 2003, one of her neighbors calls her at work and says, hey, Scott's over in your house and he's moving some things out. And she says, call the police. That guy's not supposed to be touching anything. Everything in my house is mine. The neighbor calls the police. They're pulling up. He jumps into his car and they proceed to go on a high speed chase. Eventually, they catch him and they throw him in jail, charge him with burglary or what have you. He bonds out of jail. Now, definitely, she has the protective order. So, he keeps pestering her, bothering her. I want to read a letter that she wrote, maybe possibly to herself or in her diary. This will tell you what kind of disgusting person this foul creature was. He came up to me and tried to put his arm around me. I told him not to touch me and leave me alone. I asked him what he wanted when I was walking to my truck. He said he forgot to ask me something. I asked him what it was about. Was it about the freezer that he took out of my home? I was trying to get into my truck at the time, so I got in and he kept talking. I told him I had to leave. He tried to kiss me. I pulled away and told him to quit. When he tried to do it again, I told him to stop and pushed him. He asked me why I was treating him that way. I told him I was done and I didn't want to see him no more. No means no and I had to go. He proceeded to grab my breast and say, quote, I played with your titties, unquote. And then he gets out of her truck and disappears. We're going to jump ahead to November 20th of 2003. Now, at this time, Beverly already has a protective order against Scott McLaughlin. And all of Beverly's neighbors know that this guy is nothing but trouble and that if they were to see him, immediately call 911. So on that evening, November 20th, 2003, it's nighttime and Beverly still hasn't come home from work yet. So a neighbor who was concerned that she hadn't been home because she always comes home at a certain time calls the police. The neighbor tells the police the story. There's a crazy guy that's been harassing her, bothering her over and over, stalking her, threatening her, and she hasn't come home yet. So the officers go to her job and they're looking around the scene and they discover her truck in the parking lot. And when they pull up to her truck, they notice on the ground that there is a quite a substantial amount of blood. It was an amount to the point where it quickly turned from a possible kidnapping to maybe a homicide. They don't have a body, so they don't know. So immediately they contact Scott and they can't get a hold of him. So they're doing 
their detective work and somebody had contacted the police stating that Scott was going to be showing up at a mental hospital to uh, get some kind of uh, mental health treatment. So they go to the hospital and that's where Scott is. They immediately detain him and take him to the station for questioning. So they're talking to him at the station and they say, okay, where's Beverly? We've seen a large amount of blood next to her vehicle. And at first he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything. What was the last time you seen her? Uh, I don't know, such and such day. Bantering back and forth, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is that they're talking about. So they're grilling him for what I'm just gonna go on and guess maybe hours, maybe to the wee early morning hours of November 22 of 2003. And finally, he tells them what they wanna know. He said, I killed her. Okay, well we figured that. Well, where's her body? So he takes them to a park nearby where he dumped the body. So come to find out that he met her at her job, tried to lay on the smooth talk, whatever. She told him to buzz off. He produces a knife and starts to stab her. As she's on the ground, being stabbed repeatedly over and over, he then proceeds to rape her at that very parking lot where her job is. After that's done, he takes her body. By this time, she's probably already dead. Throws it into his station wagon, drives to the park, and for some unknown reason, falls asleep. He wakes up, gets her body, drags it as far as he can. The guy's not very strong. He can't get very far with her and just leaves her there. So he goes to take the detectives to where her body remains. So they find her and they charge him with first degree murder, kidnapping, and armed criminal action. Now they're going for the death penalty. They already know about his previous rape conviction from before, from 19, I think it happened in, in the early mid eighties. So he's tried, convicted, and sentenced to die via lethal injection. Now. He would have had no other story other than him just being a murdering piece of filth until about, I want to say in 2020, maybe three or four years before his execution, all of a sudden this guy, he says, oh, wait a minute. I'm actually a woman. Oh, you're a woman. Yeah, 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 I'm a woman. Oh, okay, okay. So then you start having these bleeding hearts coming on social media. And of course the TV's talking to these weirdos who are defending the murdering scumbag, but nobody has a voice for the victim in this situation, Beverly Gunther. Nobody's talking about her. They're talking about Scott McLaughlin, who is now calling himself Amber, Amber McLaughlin. So now we have this ridiculous nonsense, this headline, first transgender woman, whatever that means, means not in my book. I don't know. I'm stupid, I guess. And as the clock starts ticking down to his eventual execution and much needed execution and deserved execution, Everybody wants to start bringing up his childhood, start bringing up his past. He had such a terrible childhood. His father abused him. Uh, his father did this to him. When he peed in the bed, his father put his face in the bed, blah, 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 blah. Let's say all of that is true. Let's say that his adoptive father was a piece of crap and he was very, very abusive. I know people that have had really crappy upbringings and they have become normal, well-rounded, well-functioning adults, like practically the entire planet, no matter what country, race, or religion you are, most people grow up to be normal. Now we all 
in this mixed bag, this world, we're gonna have our crazies. We're gonna have our psychos. We're gonna have people that are drug addicted psychos. We're gonna have people that are psychos and people with mental illness and they can't help it. But this man, it's not ma'am, it's man. This man claims he's transgender but is not accepting any kind of hormone treatments. Now, I don't know if the prison is not offering him any hormone treatments. I have no idea. But he ain't taking them. Well, gee, I thought you were a woman. Shouldn't she be getting shot up with whatever stuff that they do to stop whatever things happening to your body so you could try to pretend that you know what it's like to be a woman? Because last time I checked, and guys, I'm being silly right here. Maybe I'm in the minority, so excuse me. And if you're sensitive to what I'm about to say, tough. Last time I checked, a man doesn't know what it is to be a woman like a woman doesn't know what it is to be a man. Two totally different people. Different psychologies. And I do know that on occasion, yes, you're born one way and you're going this way and that way and blah, blah, blah. No matter what hormones, no matter what augmentation you do upon your body, no matter what you do to try to make it seem on the outside that you are the opposite sex of what you were born, you're not. And I'm not gonna get into any kind of deep uh, psychology because I'm not a doctor, I don't know. And I, don't, I ain't pretending to be one, but I do know this. I do know that a cat is not a bear and a dog is not a horse. But all these people feeling sorry for this piece of filth. What about that 14 year old girl he raped? Or as other YouTube channels call it, Ard. <laughs> What's Ard? What is this? The war on language is, it, it, it's, it's getting to a point, it's hitting a zenith in this country where you got the biggest YouTubers who are so scared to say certain words because they're so scared because the crap products that they pitch before their stories where they talk about somebody that was brutally murdered, maybe they won't endorse them anymore. Or maybe their uh, subscribers will unsubscribe because they said something mean. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely can't have that now, can we? Definitely cannot have that. That's for sure. <sighs> this video wasn't supposed to turn into a rant, but I just want to jump out of my shoes when I see stories like this, ridiculous stories. When a murderer is made to be martyred and have people feel sorry for him. That doesn't work that way in my book, guys. It doesn't work that way in my book at all. Beverly Gunther is not here to advocate for herself, to let you guys know that, hey, listen, yeah, you know, okay, you want to call him Amber? You want to call him or her? Go on ahead. You want to try to pretend that you're a woman? Okay. Well, what about this woman, me, standing in place of Beverly, what about me? What about me? I'm a woman. And he raped me. And he killed me. Have you ever been stabbed before? It's very painful. I felt the fear and the agony knowing that my life was coming to an end and my screams and nobody was there to help me. Who's her advocate? Who's her voice? Only for but a moment, I will step in and be this woman's advocate. However, however time might be fleeting, as I'm here, I'm going to give myself the authority to speak for her. And I just did. So I want everybody out there, 
particularly those who find my words offensive. I tell you one woman who probably wouldn't be offended and this woman is no longer able to speak. Let her anger ebb and flow through me out to you. Because it was wrong what happened to her. And whatever happened to him, Scott McLaughlin, as a child, does not give him the right to take what doesn't belong to him. Rest in peace to Beverly and her father, Alfred. It is never my intention on this channel to offend anybody. But sometimes, you know what? You're gonna have stupid people on YouTube, very stupid people, that are so scared to tell the truth and telling the truth feels really, really good. I do it all the time. I do it every day. And some of these YouTubers you watch every day. And some of these YouTubers, these crime YouTubers, these true crime YouTubers would allow Scott McLaughlin to be called a woman, a her, a she. Her pronouns would be she and her. Well, I tell you what, you know what his pronouns now are? Executed and dead. I'm Lamont at large. I'll see you on the next video. Peace out.